Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Len Rydell, uh, Executive Director of the Blue and Gray Education morning, Society, you. and I'd like to welcome you to, uh, I think this is probably what our uh, 23rd or 24th um, um, session uh, talking with the people who are uh, leading our programs this year and uh, uh, about what they're going to do and so forth. Um, uh, we initially started this uh, back in January as a bridge uh, for a lot of folks who have been chomping at the bit, as we all had, to uh, to get their uh, beaks wet on Civil War and history again. And um, uh, we found that the uh, response has been um, uh, very solid and, and people uh, come back week, in, week after week um, uh, or they come back when we hit the areas of specialization that they're interested in. So uh, we're, we're really uh, pleased with how this has gone. Um, as you know, uh, uh, Karen Needles, who um, works on the Lincoln Archives Project in D.C., is our host, and uh, she um, uh, puts all these things together, and uh, usually within two, three, at most four days after we finish, We've got a uh, free YouTube video that we put up. We link to the registration form, but also put it on our uh, YouTube site. Um, um, and we're building quite a collection now between um, uh, the YouTube channel, which is free for Blue and Gray, and the, um, uh, the uh, video archives for our members that um, we have been putting up, that Karen's been working for us for... Uh, over a year now, we uh, have a little over 200 lectures that are online right now. And uh, what Karen is showing you is we've got about 215, 16 subscribers now on the YouTube channel. And you can go in there and uh, you can see everything going all the way back uh, uh, into uh, January. And also um, uh, some things that we did in the the previous year, as well as some of the uh, programs, uh, you see Jeb Stewart's Ride to Glory. That's a 1994 lecture. That is the very first right. lecture that Ed Bars did for us um, in uh, Richmond, Virginia, uh, at the first BGS uh, seminar. And then there's Bud Robertson up there talking about uh, Stonewall Jackson. And for those of you who would really love some... Uh, some good and, and clean uh, entertainment. Uh, you had uh, well, when uh, shave and cut your hair. The the you know, what's what is somebody complaining about me having shaved, not shaven? Come on, guys, give me a break. You don't know what I've been through, <laughs> so I'm just happy to be here. <laughs> but um, uh, as we've offered those various um, uh, things to people. Uh, we have found that the, not only the visitation to our site has increased, but so too his membership um, uh, has grown substantially for Blue and Gray. So all this has been a very good uh, process for us. Now, uh, what we are going to do tonight is we, we have uh, the second part of, of uh, the program that we're going to be doing in December, which is the very last program of the year, uh, which is going to be uh, both Second uh, Fredericksburg and um, or uh, Fredericksburg and then Second Fredericksburg and Salem Church uh, with Paul uh, Severance uh, and Greg Mertz working together on this. And uh, what we did last week, since Greg uh, popped in on that, is we kind of ad hoced the um, uh, the uh, program and uh, had a discussion between the three of us that. Uh, produced what I have not seen before, which uh, we had nobody leave the meeting early. Um, uh, they stayed with us the entire time. So um, uh, obviously what we had to say last week was of interest to the people that were there, and I hope a number of you who are with us tonight were with us last week as well. Um, uh, as we progress through this, uh, you'll find that um, uh, we'll set the table for you for uh, what you can expect to see in uh, December, and certainly if you like what you see this evening, uh, refer your friends to it as well. Um, uh, we are back in the field, and we're uh, we're working hard with that. 
Uh, one other thing that folks would want to know, uh, I just updated our COVID guidance, and Karen, you're on that, so if you would uh, screen all the way up to the uh, start of that, you'll see the uh, BGS response to the Delta variant. Uh, we had a, um, a serious medical discussion about this uh, because we had loosened things up uh, considerably in the first four months, and then uh, talking to our medical people, including folks who are active within the uh, infectious disease uh, community, uh, that they're working and treating COVID and so forth, uh, they had sufficient doubt as to what this uh, recent breakthrough stuff of um, Delta has meant uh, to people who were otherwise immunocompromised or uh, perhaps had um, uh, multiple comorbidities like diabetes and so forth as to whether or not these breakthroughs might be uh, tied to the efficacy of a trial um, a trial uh, um, uh, vaccine. And so the infectious disease people said that they just didn't have enough um, uh, uh, contemporary information about this and and what was what may be causing it that they didn't feel comfortable with us completely unmasking and so forth. And so we've gone back and we've stepped back a little bit. We'll still keep doing the tours. Uh, and I think probably the one in December, knock on wood, uh, will abridge this particular problem. But for the August programs uh, that we've got coming up in a few weeks and perhaps in even into the September programs, the guidance that you see here is pretty straightforward and uh, it's what we'll be adhering to in the field. If you can't adhere to that uh, or don't want to adhere to that, I certainly respect that. Um, uh, but this is the way we're going to have to be doing things at least for the next month or two. So if you're thinking about joining us, uh, please read and heed because we really can't make exceptions for anybody. We have to do what we need to do to uh, conduct these safely um, because that's what the insurance company tells us we have to do as well if our insurance is to cover us and so forth. So we continue to soldier ahead. We've had some wonderful programs. We had uh, over 30 people for um, uh, for um, uh, Scott uh, Hartwig up in Gettysburg. Uh, and generally speaking, uh, our vehicles have, have for the most part been full with uh, what we've been doing since we restarted in April. Um, whether it be uh, vans or 15 passenger buses or uh, perhaps a little bit larger buses. We did a 40 passenger bus for Gettysburg. So we're adapting to everything. And um, uh, if you are interested in joining us, um, uh, everything you need to know is on our website. And I encourage you to go take a hard look at it and, and we'll go from there. Um, uh, if you are interested in our, um, um, in our, uh, video archives series and you are not yet a member of Blue and Gray, you can do that by joining Blue and Gray and then registering and then you have access. Uh, right now we have over 200 of the more than 300 uh, videos that we intend to put online this year. Um, and uh, they have proven to be popular and, and we have uh, uh, well over 200 people have uh, got registered and gotten IDs for that as well. So um, there's a lot of good information out there. You don't necessarily have to be out with us. Things like we do tonight and, and other things like that um, are contributing mightily. And for those of you who may still be homebound or finding it too far to go, we encourage you to go back into our archives and look at the stuff that we've done and um, uh, enjoy yourself and enhance things uh, a bit. Um, Karen is showing there the video archives section there um, that um, you can go out and and um, basically involve yourself in and see all the stuff that is on there. I think the last stuff we put out there was uh, the Mobile campaign, which goes back, I think, to uh, 1995. And today I was doing introductions for stuff in 2003. So uh, a lot of stuff you have to post up there, and I hope you'll enjoy it. So... Uh, with that, um, uh, uh, Karen would like me to make um, uh, 
and, and a, an awareness appeal to all of you, which I will do. Um, as the government attempts to come back in and, and do things, and of course, I think the latest announcements the last couple of days are likely to provide a further setback to um, getting the archives reopened and accessible to everybody. But uh, nonetheless, the restrictions that are on the use of the archives right now are pretty considerable. And while it affects uh, Karen, who's a professional uh, who works at the archives almost daily when before COVID, uh, doing research and the Lincoln Archives Project and so forth. Uh, the restrictions to use the archives are pretty significant. And Karen asks and encourages you, uh, if you'd like to know more, to reach her and then reach out to your congressional representatives and ask them uh, and insist that they pay attention to reopening uh, the archives of the United States so that uh, people can do quality research and get fair and um, comprehensive access to those. Well, good evening again. Um, uh, we're joined uh, by uh, uh, a soon-to-be dynamic duo uh, who will be working uh, together. Initially, I was going to separate uh, these in two separate programs uh, with Paul Severance, who is doing the Battle of Fredericksburg and plans to do a, um, a staff ride uh, uh, of Fredericksburg along the lines of what he has done uh, for senior leadership at the National Defense University at Fort McNair, where he was an instructor for a lot, a lot of years, and from where he recently retired, but still does um, some um, uh, ad hoc work for him. And uh, Greg Mertz, who uh, has just recently retired as a supervisory historian at the uh, Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville, Spotsylvania National Military Park. Um, um, and uh, uh, he did his first civilian ride for us uh, at Shiloh in April, which indeed was um, the uh, second program that we did um, uh, after we started again and, and went extremely well and folks spoke very highly of it. Any of you who have ever been out with Greg appreciate that, that he's an outstanding public historian and uh, between that and um, Paul Severance, uh, the question when you see him working together is are they Batman and Robin or are they Laurel and Hardy? Uh, the, the audience is still out on that. So uh, with that, where we left off last week was um, uh, we had uh, finished up talking about the Battle of Fredericksburg, and um, uh, what I'd like to open up with is uh, uh, is ask uh, Greg, um, uh, what what happens uh, to the two armies once um, uh, Burnside pulls back across the Rappahannock? What happens uh, to the armies in uh, January and February? Well, Ambrose Burnside is not content with going into winter quarters after such a horrible defeat at Fredericksburg and decided that he wanted to, this time, march upstream um, to go further to the west and cross over and try to get behind the Confederates. Um, pretty good plan, as we will see as we look at um, what Hooker uh, proposes to do. It's kind of similar to what he wanted to do, but on not quite the grander scale. The big problem is that the weather turned against Burnside and that maneuver became known as the Mud March. Um, some subordinates will go um, behind Burnside's back and will complain about him to politicians or people that they know in the War Department. Others will be more upfront of in complaining about Burnside, including Joseph Hooker. But um, in the long run, uh, Hooker will, excuse me, uh, Burnside will present a list of officers to Abraham Lincoln saying basically either they go or I go. And I think because of the list of experienced officers, Burnside knew what the result was going to be. So Burnside would uh, get reassigned. He will take his Ninth Corps away from the Army of the Potomac and will go uh, command the department in Ohio. 
for the Confederates, the um, most interesting thing that will happen is that in regard to supplying the army, um, Lee will find that his supplies are lacking. He's getting two trains a day of supplies, and uh, the person that is running the uh, rail line operating the, the section leading up to him is someone born in the state of Pennsylvania, um, who is a Northern sympathizer and as uh, unbeknown to the Confederates, part of a spy ring that Joseph Hooker has uh, going on. Um, and um, he will um, try to see if there's some way to improve supplies, uh, get more trains coming, put more cars on the train, maybe load them down more. And the man in charge, a uh, man named Samuel Ruth, preaches doom and gloom if we try to do any more than, than what they're doing. He says equipment will break down. Um, so perhaps in part be that and part because of other military um, uh, contingencies, Lee will detach a significant part of his army, about a quarter of his infantry under James Longstreet will go in the southeastern part of the state, a whole lot of his artillery and cavalry because the biggest uh, supply consumers are obviously the horses, they are also going to go further south and Robert E. Lee's plans at the moment are whenever the pastures start to green up around Fredericksburg, he will and therefore horses can live off the land, he will reunite his army. And I'm convinced uh, that over this winter, he's already thinking about going into Pennsylvania and what will become the Gettysburg campaign. But he is delaying that until the weather um, gets nice enough that uh, pastures um, start to green up and uh, there's enough grasses to feed his army. Thanks. So Paul, um, you have uh, spent much of your career um, um, talking to general officers, teaching general officers and so forth. Um, what do you get out of, um, uh, and what, what do you tell general officers today about what they can and should have learned about um, uh, the relationships within Burnside's Army, Burnside's Command, and or uh, Lee's relations and Lee's commands? Well, probably the, uh, the principal thing for me is the uh, necessity to try and establish early on what I have come to refer to as conceptual unity, wherein all the major commanders, and as far down the chain as you can push it, understand the commander's intent and have a firm grasp of the commander's concept of the operation. This, if nothing else, as we, as we really see in Gettysburg and as we see in Wilcox at 2nd Fredericksburg, uh, allows junior officers at various points down the chain of command to take the initiative. Uh, in some case, even disobey orders, which is always a constant uh, tension. Should I just obey my orders or should I, I see an opportunity here? and take the initiative, and I, I think we'll talk a little bit about Wilcox. He does an incredible job uh, at the 2nd Fredericksburg. But as you pointed out, you know, trying to create conceptual unity in the Army of the Potomac is damn near impossible. The politicization of the, of the Army at this time is just rife. I mean, it is, you can't get guys to get in the harness and pull all at the same time, and at the same time, there's a reluctance uh, to take initiative to the point where the failure uh, reverts back to you. So that's something that, you, you know, you try and get senior officers to think about how do you create conceptual unity. I mean, for me, the classic case is, is Meade at Gettysburg. Everybody knew what the mission was. We're going to defend all kinds of junior officers could take the initiatives like Strong Vincent and Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain and folks of that nature and 12th Corps. Um, but it's hard to, uh, to get them to understand that because the, lat the other thing that enters into this is just 
not necessarily the politicization, but the personalities involved. And there's a lot of personalities that uh, are abrasive. On the Confederate side, you know, the thing that's most amazing to me, uh, you know, Lee is constantly reorganizing, especially with his artillery. And two, he's got a command team, what we refer to as a command team, that's, um, I mean, just about this stage, damn near invincible. And of course, that's Lee, Jackson, uh, Longstreet, and Stewart. And uh, they are able to exercise that sense of, I think, conceptual unity about what the mission is um, much more effectively than they can do in the union side of the coin for a number of reasons. There's other reasons too, you know, staff work. I mean, we won't go into the vagaries of staff work, but, you know, the Army of Potomac had a great staff, guys like Henry Hunt, you know, uh, the Army of Northern Virginia, not so good, very small. And so trying to create conceptual unity and then get it executed at the point of the spear without adequate staff uh, is a real challenge. So, uh, again, this idea of conceptual unity has to permeate down to the staff officers so that they can do their piece uh, of the operation when the time comes, and especially if it doesn't go as planned, uh, that folks can st step up and say, let me, let me solve this problem. Let me, let me take the bull by the horns here. Greg, um, what Lee does, and you, you uh, spoke to it directly uh, in your first uh, opening comments um, uh, about breaking and sending away parts of his army uh, for the winter so that uh, he could relieve some of the burden on his supply challenges uh, seems to me certainly a considered uh, risk uh, that he believed that perhaps his position was so strong and the effects of the weather uh, in January and February would be such that his, um, his risk to both his position and his army might be minimal as he sends them uh, to uh, to spots where they can uh, be fed and, and reinforce themselves and so forth. Um, do, in your opinion, uh, why do you think that Lee gets caught uh, with effectively with his pants down uh, when when uh, Hooker steals a march on him? Has, has, has Lee made a a mistake or are there external factors uh, involved that uh, the friction that Lee can't see that uh, causes him to uh, get caught in this situation at Chancellorsville? Um, but one of the things that um, will happen is that um, Joseph Hooker will do a, a very good job of making it unclear exactly what his intentions are. Um, one of the things that he will do is send a main force off to the upper left-hand portion of the map um, to go in the vicinity of Kelly's Ford. Um, you can see Roman numerals for the 5th, uh, 11th, and 12th Corps going up in the area of Kelly's Ford. What the map doesn't uh, show is that there's also a a Union cavalry force that is operating in that particular area. And uh, you can also see in the upper left-hand portion a Confederate cavalry unit labeled as Fitzhugh Lee, but Jeb Stewart himself is out there. And when the Union cavalry crosses over the, the river, it starts to move in the direction of the railroad that you can just barely see stretching behind, between Brandy Station and Rappahannock Station. That railroad goes off the map on to the south. And at first, Jeb Stewart thought, oh, this is a, a, an advance down that railroad, that the Union Army is going to utilize that for some kind of advance. This is the Orange and Alexandria Railroad, and uh, a railroad that was in use during you know, the Second Manassas Campaign, for example. And... Um, Jeb Stewart will for a while miss the Union infantry crossing over at Kelly's Ford, who don't continue in the direction of that railroad, but as the arrows show, will start to swing to the east. 
And as a, a good example of this, um, um, just about the uh, the middle of the map off to the left is a place called Germana Ford on the Rapidan River. Uh, Lee has a bridge building operation right there at Germana Ford as he's getting prepared for the Gettysburg campaign. He knows that whenever he leaves Fredericksburg, he'd like to march west and get into the Shenandoah Valley. Well, there's, a, again, a group of Confederates. They've got some infantry, a little bit of cavalry there, and, and a bunch of workers building a bridge. When all of a sudden a, a citizen comes in and says, there's Union troops heading toward you. And the Confederates at Germanda Ford are incredulous. It says, there can't be forces heading toward us. Jeb Stewart would have let us know. Um, of course, what the folks at Germano Ford don't know is that Stewart is trying to stay between the Union Army and the railroad. And so now all of a sudden, here come infantrymen at Germano Ford. And uh, on that same day, um, near the lower right-hand portion of the map, there are some troops on uh, the 27th of April. So we're talking uh, the battle actually gets underway on May 1st. So basically three days before the battle, another Union force under Sedgwick and Reynolds that will be the uh, kind of the, uh, the, the topic of our uh, tour covering 2nd Fredericksburg and Salem Church. They cross over the river to try to make it look like they're going to attack the Confederate line at the same place where there was success in the first battle of Fredericksburg. So part of the reason why Lee is unaware of what is, is going on is the misinterpretation of Stuart at what he saw going on at the West. And now uh, what's going on just south of Fredericksburg where Sedgwick and Reynolds cross over. So the Confederates are going to spend a little time trying to figure out exactly what it is that they are observing well, you know, I do, I do recall that um, uh, there is a lot going on in Richmond and, and elsewhere within Lee's department. I, I, you know, I think a lot of times people forget that Lee uh, is not just responsible for the Army of Northern Virginia, but he is also uh, uh, overseeing operations uh, throughout uh, the district in there. Um, and um, uh, with the... Uh, detachment of, of Longstreet and um, a steward away from him, uh, they're there certainly, I, I recall seeing that uh, Lee intended, he sent a uh, warning order uh, out to people around the 20th of March, advising them of his intention to organize the spring campaign and to move north to Pennsylvania as early as 20 March. Uh, and then I know in, in April, uh, Jefferson Davis gets, gets deathly sick and all the, all the wheels of approval just grind to a halt as, as, as people try to access David at, Davis at the Confederate White House and what he's, he's able to deal with. And then the Federals begin to move uh, uh, in early um, uh, against Charleston and uh, there is a considerable fear that perhaps the Federals are going to are going to strike like they did at Port Royal and uh, and start the spring campaign coming in. So certainly uh, the the manner in which uh, Lee seems to be constrained in bringing Longstreet back to rejoin him and uh, to get his force ready there um, shows that he's got uh, many demands on on few resources and once deployed, it was hard to, uh, to shake Longstreet uh, loose to come back. Having said that, um, Paul, uh, you know, Burnside loses his job um, uh, through, a, through a result of his own ineptitude, I think, and a lot of um, a skullduggery. Um, what, what, what's your uh, view and opinion of, uh, of uh, Joe Hooker, uh, what do you think's good about him, and what what portions of him uh, would you not want to see in a in a person who is commanding an army? Well, you know, Fighting Joe has uh, 
quite a 360-degree reputation in my mind. Uh, there's no doubt that he is, uh, at least until Chancellorsville, and then afterwards when he goes to the West, uh, a very competent general officer. Uh, one of the things he does do, of course, after Fredericksburg, you know, morale is, is you know, down the tubes in the Army of the Potomac, although they, most of the folks think they were all general, not, uh, you know, defeated outright. And of course, Lincoln's letter to Burnside, you know, says, look, <laughs> or to the Army, uh, was very conciliatory uh, about, uh, you know, it was, it's just the way it happened. And uh, Hooker takes the effort to, uh, number one, reorganize, get rid of those grand divisions. Um, he is uh, starts to give furloughs uh, to let the troops go home to increase morale. Uh, he takes great pains to make sure that the army is well fed uh, and has the provisions and the supplies uh, that they need for an upcoming campaign, which of course turns out to be Chancellorsville initially. And then after that, at Gettysburg, uh, the Union Army is not on a campaign, it's reacting to Lee's campaign. Uh, so in that sense, a lot of very positive things. And of course, the other idea of putting core insignia uh, on the uniforms of the uh, soldiers, especially on their hats, so that he could identify uh, troops and other commanders could identify troops on the battlefield, especially riding on horseback. Uh, is a very positive command and control as well as morale builder for the Army of the Potomac. On the other hand, uh, you know, he's kind of, uh, he's kind of got some bad habits. Uh, I won't go into those in depth, but uh, he surrounds himself with a bunch of cronies that like to um, cavort. Uh, he is heavily politicized. He contributes to the politicization uh, of the Army um, uh, of the Potomac. And as we approach, uh, you know, the summer, uh, commanders start to leave. You know, Cooch leaves, Darius Cooch leaves, uh, Sumner leaves. Um, so in that sense, his, his proclivity for uh, uh, politics, again, contributes uh, to the cohesion and the ability to uh, to to uh, create uh, conceptual unity and uh, contributes to command dissonance. So it's a mixed bag, in my view. But there's no doubting, you know, his courage, and he and he's, and he's skillful. He, he, he's a good commander. He goes out west, does a hell of a job out there. Greg, um, uh, as we as we turn to. Um uh, Chancellorsville and uh, the uh, the efforts that that drive us to the Second Fredericksburg and then bring uh, the federal forces together. Uh, would you explain what um, uh, Hooker's plan is for the spring campaign? Well, Joseph Hooker. Um, to also piggyback off what Paul was talking about, um, Joseph Hooker as he's scraps the Grand Division plan, will have seven infantry corps that report to him. And part of the reason why he is reducing um, the number of subordinates or, the, you know, taking what Burnside had where there's three subordinates that he reported to and increasing it to seven, is because he feels that the, the telegraph um, invention will enable him to better uh, communicate with uh, all the different corps in the army. Um, he does not, however, uh, let his um, signal officers know this and the Chancellorsville campaign comes about with them adequately um, lacking in the um, amount of material that they need. They have no idea the miles that Joseph Hooker intends to march by going 25 miles upstream from, from Fredericksburg, for example. So his, um, his um, ability to communicate with his subordinates is going to be hampered by that, particularly dealing with Sedgwick in the East. Um, exactly what he had in mind is difficult to know. Um, 
Some believe that he was counting on his cavalry, that um, he thought that by taking this cavalry corps that he created of some 10, 12,000 men, sending them down to cut off the, the rail line, there you can see at the bottom those arrows of the cavalry unit, the dotted the line in, in blue shows the Union cavalry leading, leaving the Fredericksburg area, heading west, then south, and then going east to strike the railroad uh, at some, some key points. That if he disrupts the railroad line, we've already discussed that Lee is not getting enough supplies along that, that maybe he is thinking that Lee has no choice but to to pull back out of Fredericksburg. Um, but his main movement, that larger solid arrow that you see going west uh, to Kelly's Ford and then cutting back through Germana Ford heading toward Fredericksburg was to go into Lee's rear. Seems to me Hooker either thinks Confederates are going to retreat because of their line of supply broken, or if they uh, don't react in time, that um, Hooker is going to be in Lee's rear, and as Hooker would say, force Lee to fight in ground of his own choosing. Um, so that's the best we can tell of what um, Joseph Hooker's plan was. Uh, he's not very good at communicating this to his subordinates. Um, and for example, when he gets into the Chancellorsville Crossroads on the last day of April, Meade, uh, one of the Corps commanders, and Henry Slocum, another Corps commander, are jubilant. They think they understand that uh, they have gotten into Lee's rear, that he's not aware of it. There's been very slight resistance. They're anxious to continue their march because what they found themselves into was an area known as the wilderness of Spotsylvania, thick, dense woods, and in theory, the Union Army to take advantage of its superior numbers and its superior cannon is to get into the open. And when Slocum explains, hey, I've gotten a message from Hooker to hold up at Chancellorsville to wait for more troops to come up, um, they, uh, they're they clearly, um, at least Meade is uh, upset and confused by this. So um, the subordinates thought they understood what the, the plan was. And now they arrive in Chancellorsville and find uh, no, uh, there's to hold up. So they, as this map shows, they will not move out of the Chancellorsville intersection until um, later in the morning of May 1st. They will, they will hold up um, right around the Chancellorsville intersection and give the Confederates some time to react. Let me ask you a, a question. Um, um, Paul, I think one of the things that that um, uh, is probably understated, uh, but I think perhaps had uh, much more influence than most people appreciate, is uh, one of the things that Hooker did was he established a, a board of military uh, intelligence or a bureau of military intelligence. Um, would you uh, uh, comment on that and and what you? Uh, believe the impact that was on the Union war effort? Well, <clears throat> in my view, it's a, uh, it's a brilliant move. I mean, uh, if you think about it in the aggregate, and I think most historians, or at least Army historians, would be of the same opinion, what Hooker has created here under Sharp, and is, uh, what do they call it, the soda biscuit scouts, uh, as they were referred to, is uh, the first real intelligence fusion center in the Army. And what these guys would do, uh, they would do the usual stuff, read newspapers. Uh, they would debrief cavalry patrols and reconnaissances when they came back in. Uh, they would interrogate prisoners. Uh, they would go into the towns and talk to civilians. And in certain cases, what the group called the Soda Biscuit Spies, you know, would go behind the lines and same way that Mosby did, same way that Stewart did, and bring it all back and then correlate uh, an operation, a common operational picture. They were so good at 
that, that uh, for instance, at Gettysburg, I think is a classic example, after the second day's fighting, they had identified every single Confederate unit, unit on the battlefield except for one outfit that wasn't there, and that was Pickett, because he was still coming up uh, for the day three festivities. So these guys were really excellent at what they did, uh, and Meade uh, used them, as well as Hooker, to great advantage. But the idea here was to get some form of fusion of the many different intelligence sources to, to try and paint a common operational picture to support an estimate of the operational and tactical situations. They were good. They were really good at what they did. Thanks. Uh, Greg, one other thing that has, has bothered me for a number of years, and, and, I'd, and I'd like to get uh, uh, your view and perhaps the consensus of uh, your uh, historian's many years of experience uh, in and around Chancellorsville is, is uh, I've always been struck, and I thought Stephen Sears um, did a, a very fine job of, of articulating what uh, Hooker's plan may have been, and uh, in this comment, Lee must attack me in my trenches or flee ingloriously. You've laid out why and how Lee may have to flee based on Stoneman's operations and or the ability to get in Lee's rear and even the interpretation of Jackson's march at uh, Chancellorsville to some perception that that was Lee fleeing this battlefield because of what Hooker had done, uh, and Hooker's counter that was not to go out and fight Lee in an open battlefield, but rather, once he pulls back after the engagement on the first day, he begins to build this, this huge set of fortifications of which the extreme right is, uh, is the 11th Corps. And uh, uh, Sears postulates that he believes that uh, that Hooker was lacking one corps that hadn't come up yet because they were tied up at Fredericksburg and so forth, and that last corps would have linked on Hooker's or on um, on Howard's right and would have continued over and anchored itself on the uh, Rapidan River near Ely Ford, and that would have then created this huge defensive work, which could then receive Lee's assaults, which was. Hooker effectively saying that he could be attacked on ground of his own choosing. Do you all, what, what has been the consensus of, of uh, you guys who have spent 30 plus years studying uh, the Chancellorsville battlefield? How do, you, how do you view that? Is that a, is that a fair belief or is it uh, just something that maybe uh, Steve pulled out of uh, the air somewhere and didn't have a whole lot of basis in operational fact? First of all, one of the other things that um, that Sears comments upon is that perhaps one of the lessons that Hooker and anyone should take away from the Battle of Fredericksburg is how if you set up a firm defensive position and you can make the enemy attack that, that that is the, the, the best way to win a Civil War battle and that when Hooker found that he couldn't get to the open ground that he felt the best thing for him to do was to draw back into the Chancellorsville intersection area, uh, set up a strong defensive position and make the Confederates attack him. Why might the Confederates be forced to attack him? Well, um, if the line of supply is cut to the south, the next way that Joseph Hook, or the, what, the next way in which the uh, Confederates might get supplies, is to head west toward the Orange and Alexandria Railroad that we were peeking at when we looked at Kelly's Ford earlier. So, in the map that you see there, the blue lines of Meade and Couch and Slocum, and even though Sickles has moved out, you can see the the shadow of where his troops used to be as they connected with Howard, that uh, the best roads to head west are the Orange Plank Road and the Orange Turnpike that converge at the Chancellorsville intersection. So if you can build a bubble around there, you can force the Confederates to, to head back in that, in that direction. 
Um, uh, what was the other part of your question? So that's that's maybe why he goes in the defensive position. Um, well, I, I'm I'm wondering uh, the 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 oh, about uh, Reynolds. Case. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I remember now. You are asking about if it was true that there was to be some forces to go from the end of Howard's line to tie up to the Rapidan River. Well, what you see on the map here. You go to the lower right hand portion, you can see right next to Sedgwick there is a, a shadow, a box. That is where some of Reynolds's troops were. And um, uh, an order was sent, again, what you're seeing here is, is May 2nd, but an order was sent on the 1st of May by Hooker to Sedgwick to tell him to take Reynolds and pull some of his troops across the river and get them marching under the cover of darkness. But as I mentioned before, there are problems with the telegraph system and the um, uh, signal corps doesn't have the equipment to cover this amount of distance. And the message doesn't get to Sedgwick until the morning. So troops that might have been taking a night maneuver and might have reasonably been in position are first uh, making their march um, uh, on the, the morning of May 2nd and will not be there by the evening. Uh, I don't know exactly where they will get, but as you can see, this map will show Reynolds at the United States Ford um, uh, so he will not be in position. But no, this is, is something that was definitely planned. And had um, the telegraph system been set up the way Hooker liked to use it, um, wanted to use it, the message might have been delivered in time for that to have taken place. Yeah. In, in Sed Sedgwick, of course, when he, in, in his official report, says, I couldn't get back across the river and, you know, get moving. So he decides to go across country, essentially, to get up to the, to the twin roads. And, of course, he runs into resistance uh, by doing that. So he's, instead of having basically an, an unobstructed line the whole way, uh, he's kind of, you know, fighting uh, as he goes. And, of course, this brings us back to the point of... Uh, uh, Barksdale and Early and Wilcox doing a superb job of, of uh, delaying actions to keep Sedgwick from uh, coming in on Lee's rear um, while he continues to, you know, the main engagement uh, at Chancellorsville. So it's a classic study of delay tactics or Fabian uh, tactics, if you will, trading space for time. And the thing that's interesting to me more than anything is Wilcox was told to, you know, come come to uh, to fall back uh, as soon as uh, Sedgwick uh, starts to move, and he says, "Nah, I don't think so. I think I can do more here." Uh, early in Barksdale, go back, but Wilcox uh, delays them for quite a long time until finally, uh, I think McClaws and um, Anderson is that right? Uh, bring us to Salem Church, which I'll certainly let Greg <laughs> run the trap lines on that one. You know, the thing that, um, that strikes me, and, and, and I, I do want to want to turn us towards Fredericksburg right now. Uh, Greg, earlier you mentioned and talked about uh, the decoupling of the, of the Grand Divisions uh, under Burnside to uh, uh, give Hooker uh, the ability to reach out and touch each of his seven core and his core commanders, which gave him more, I think, tactical control of, uh, of what he wanted various components of his forces to do. What I'm struck at as I look at this map in front of me, and it is not dissimilar to the challenge that, um, um, that uh, Lee uh, and McClellan encountered down along the Chickahominy during the seven days with the control of these fords and these bridges uh, to cross the rivers. Um, you know, if, if Hooker stays north of the, Rap of the Rappahannock River, there's no impetus for Robert E. Lee to come out of his fortifications and do what uh, Burnside did, which was attack uh, uh, Hooker on the high ground at Stafford Heights and so forth, but rather he can sit there 
as long as uh, as Hooker is stationary. But as Hooker moves over and he starts to deploy his forces and invite Lee to uh, to bash himself against the um, against the uh, Union fortifications, he has the control of Ely's Ford. He has U.S. Ford, and presumably, as he collapses down this this uh, operation at Fredericksburg and moves out, he also controls Banks Ford. So he has this ability basically to compress and and force Lee, once he's off the high ground of Fredericksburg Heights, he's able to force him to abandon this area and perhaps flee across uh, the open ground, which is what was reported when they, they spot Jackson on his flank march, that they think that perhaps Lee is is leaving the area and he's he's headed for the railroad to protect that. So having said that, tell me about, Greg, tell me about um, why the Federals, uh, why uh, and what Meade or uh, Hooker wants out of the forces in front of Fredericksburg. What Hooker expects from the forces in front of Fredericksburg probably changes during the campaign as the situation develops. Um, I say probably because he is really not very clear in you know issuing the uh, his commander's intent. But his first uh, job. Let's see if I can find a, the best uh, map for that. Well, why don't we go ahead to map map three, the one that talks about May that's labeled as May first. Um, the initial role of Sedgwick is to be a decoy to try to make it appear that the Union Army is going to duplicate the successful aspect of the Battle of Fredericksburg. And in the Battle of Fredericksburg, the Union Army um, had one bridge site and three bridges to cross over all of the forces that would be engaged in what we call the southern end of the battlefield. But here on this, on the, in the day of April 27th, when they laid down the bridges, there are two bridge sites. You can see there's one behind Reynolds and one behind Sedgwick in the lower right-hand corner. And there are a total of five pontoon bridges. So if you're the Confederates and you're spotting this, knowing that one site and three bridges in the main battle of Fredericksburg is now in that same site, there's two crossings and five bridges. It probably looked like there was indeed going to be a major crossing there. Um, and so it took the Confederates a little while before they decided just what it is they were going to do. Um, Jackson, as he looked at Sedgwick and Reynolds with their back to the river um, and seeing that they were kind of hanging close to the river, did make a proposal to Robert E. Lee to attack them and drive them into the river. Um, as you can kind of see labeled behind that, just above Sedgwick is Heights and further up in the map is the word Stafford. Stafford Heights lines the river. It is teeming with artillery and um, Lee told Jackson that he didn't think um, that if he drove the Union Army into the river, he'd have a hard time getting away because of the artillery. I suspect that perhaps the fog on the, on the morning of the last day of, of April uh, may have caused Jackson to feel that the artillery may not have uh, had a uh, opportunity to be as effective. But at any rate, um, the conversation um, ended up resulting with the Confederates deciding that they would not try to fight Sedgwick and Reynolds and that they would turn around and send the bulk of their army out in the direction of, of uh, Chancellorsville. So Sedgwick and Reynolds, I think you would say, did a wonderful job with their first mission, that is to make it look like there's going to be a major attack there. They, I think you couldn't expect them to to have uh, held the Confederates in place south of Fredericksburg for any longer than they did. Um, now, um, the, the next kind of set of orders that Sedgwick will get are basically to try to uh, make sure that the Confederates that are left behind 
uh, will, will stay in place to launch some probes there at various times. And then finally, the instructions are going to change to, if we can go to Karen, map number, uh, map number five. Now, um, after Jackson launches his famous flank attack on May 2nd, the, I planned for May 3rd uh, for Joseph Hooker. And uh, with a little tongue in cheek, I point out that Hooker has not suffered his concussion yet. <laughs> but that is, as Joseph Hooker is going to be fighting out at Chancellorsville on May 3rd with, and can count them on the map, six core um, um, and a body of, oh, probably 85, 90,000 soldiers before casualties that um, Joseph Hooker decides that he is going to just kind of hold tight and be the anvil, if you will, to Sedgwick Sledgehammer. Um, Sedgwick gets orders at about 10 o'clock at night on May 2nd, so there's not much time to, there's, there's no time to utilize any daylight to get prepared, but he's given orders to brush aside whatever Confederates are in his front to march out to Chancellorsville and come in on the rear of Robert E. Lee. Yeah, you know, this is this is trying to show a whole lot in one map, but forget about the, the troops that you see there labeled at McClaws. But his goal is to come and by daylight to be up in the area kind of where you see the word Stuart coming in and rear of the Confederate Army. It's an impossible order to carry out. Um, yet that is what Hooker um, expects. That's why I, I, again, with tongue in cheek, say, remind you, this is before Hooker suffered his concussion when he came up with this, this plan. But it is, it is a fascination because as you look at it, and of course, when you, you laid this out, the dates were important because uh, this is enough of a force to screen a very substantial movement of uh, troops completely out of the sight of what Robert E. Lee is uh, anticipating. And the first look of this, Lee is still up on Fredericksburg Heights and his, uh, his winter force is still fundamentally in place there. It is not until uh, the crossings begin to take place well above and behind Lee that he's now faced with the uh, shoot in both directions uh, type of, a, of an arrangement in which Hooker has in fact stolen a march on him and has, has put him in a bad way. The thing that I'm, I'm struck with is the, um, is the manner in which, and, and, and I'd like to ask you to expand a little further on this, um, uh, Greg, and then I'm going to ask um, uh, Paul to follow on with that, with this this uh, use of shock troops with Wilcox and so forth, McLaws, and this this confrontation at Salem Church that basically breaks the uh, the spear and arrow that is heading to uh, into Lee's back, which perhaps could have broken his back had um, in fact Lee not responded in the manner in which he did. So, Greg, I'd like to, uh, you, you, you talked about this being folly. Is it just because of the distance involved that it is just physically impossible for Sedgwick uh, to make his way out to become a factor uh, on Lee uh, by first thing in the morning? Um, it's a combination of distance and what he expected Sedgwick to be able to do at night. Maybe uh, it makes me even wonder what kind of understanding Hooker has of the situation. Uh, for example, one of the things that caused just a little bit of confusion, Hooker's orders told Sedgwick to cross at Fredericksburg. And so part of what they tried to figure out is all right by saying at Fredericksburg we are now south of Fredericksburg does Hooker for some reason expect us to cross back over the river at the two bridges that you see there 
and then march up to Fredericksburg and lay down some bridges at that point and cross over. Um, very quickly, Sedgwick and his subordinates said, well, that makes no sense. We're going to have to slide up, um, go north from uh, where they were to get into Fredericksburg. Uh, Fredericksburg, of course, has the the, the key road leading to the west. They're going to go out to Chancellorsville. They do have to go up that way. But um, he, he said, you know, execute this immediately so that you can be out here by dawn. I mean, how many night attacks do we know about and how many night attacks made by up to 25,000 soldiers against 10,000 soldiers do we know about? Um, Rappahannock Station numbers I don't have off the top of my head, but that was relatively small. Um, but night attacks just aren't done. And if you were going to do one, uh, the Rappahannock Station, for example, was done at dusk. So the men spent the afternoon in daylight preparing and getting in position and then waited till it got dark to spring their attack. To ask folks to go and get organized at night to launch a night attack just is incredibly uh, unreasonable. Um, and then to go ahead and march uh, what would be about eight miles out to be in Lee's rear at Chancellorsville, eight or nine miles. Um, just so the, the, not just the not just the distance, not just the time, but what Hooker would have expected Sedgwick to accomplish in the dark. Thanks. Um, be, Paul, before you uh, comment on uh, Wilcox and the and the, the Confederate response to this move. Uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Um, uh, we may be able to take one or two before we reach 9 o'clock and, and wrap this up. But um, uh, I want Paul to go ahead and address this, um, uh, this uh, impressive uh, operation with Wilcox and so forth. And uh, then if we have any time, we'll, uh, we'll take a question or two. Uh, Paul, what's you, you yeah, have some feelings about that? Basic, yeah, basically three points that that stick in my mind. The first one, of course, is uh, Lee's audacity. Even though he's being pressed, you know, uh, as Greg pointed out, you know, between an anvil and a hammer, uh, he's actually uh, moving to attack and destroy Sedgwick. It was his. Uh, it's a pretty good chunk of the army if you can take Sedgwick down. So he is. Uh, even though he's uh, he's got enough to uh, keep him occupied in and around Chancellorsville, um, he still uh, has the audacity uh, to uh, break off and go after Cedric. Along the same lines, masterful job of using interior lines of communication. Uh, he has got that advantage to him. And as we see when uh, Early and McLaws, uh, you know, uh, fall in to uh, support Wilcox, um, it's an excellent uh, operational and tactical example uh, of the use of uh, interior lines. By the same token, for all intents and purposes, Hooker is using exterior lines that are longer, doesn't have the same road net that, uh, that Lee certainly enjoys, and it's kind of the reverse of the uh, fish hook, if you think about it, uh, at Gettysburg. And third, it, there's the whole question of how do you command and control two separate operations over such an immense sheer distance with that type of geography? I mean, when you start and ticking off uh, the geographical dimensions, the decisive terrain, of the, as you pointed out, Len, of the banks and the rivers, and, you know, the fords in the rivers, uh, the heavy timber lines, uh, successive heights, uh, the road net, a river. Uh, I mean, the weather, the fog. I mean, it was all there. So from a, uh, from a, a planning and execution point, um, this is an amazing study in a battle of elements, of geographic elements. And um, it, it's, it's just if you're a geographer, you love it. As, uh, as Halford McKinder said, uh, you know, man proposes, but nature disposes. And uh, you, you, the first, if there's a first principle in warfare, it's terrain and geography and, 
you know, the, the five types of terrain that Sunzo talked about way back, uh, you know, uh, 4,000 years ago, uh, still holds true. And this is a classic study. You know, the thing that, that um, uh, you, you can start to add one and one and one and get three uh, when you think about this, and I'm glad you, you wrapped up this uh, in that manner, Paul, because uh, what is the most important function um, uh, in the establishment of a professional uh, military school for the United States Army, but it's uh, to be an engineering school, to, uh, to, uh, to create officers who can move earth and, uh, and, and master rivers and streams and uh, forests and unpaved roads and all these things so that they can efficiently move from one point to the next and bring combat power to bear. And so uh, Robert E. Lee's an engineer, number two in his class. He, he's an engineer. And, and people, uh, for years and years and years, that was where all the most successful graduates, the top graduates of West Point went, was into the engineering field to, to master these. And you have, uh, you have corduroyed roads here, uh, uh, planked roads and so forth. And when you look at the decisions that are made and how you moved troops, uh, the thing that always strikes me and, and certainly will come up as we uh, go through this program and uh, conduct it in December is uh, you go back to the principles of war that you have hammered for years and years and years. And Greg, I know you've done them many times in staff rides that you have done for military groups and stuff. Joseph Hooker's major mistake of everything in he did here, to my way of thinking, is he surrendered the initiative. He went from an offensive operation in which his turning movement was very offensive and very dramatic and forced Lee into, into a uh, catastrophic response and a roll all the dice uh, effort to turn it around. And he surrendered the initiative to Robert E. Lee and uh, it allowed him to sit in place. And then I think subsequently, that's what makes it possible to release McLaws and, and Wilcox and Early all come because Hooker is not pressing Lee in any way, shape, or form at Chancellorsville. And so Lee can spare these people to deal with this, with this uh, fairly limited initiative. So uh, I think... I think that um, uh, for many, many reasons, both uh, the Battle of Fredericksburg, which, uh, which you're going to cover, and the, uh, the Second Battle of Fredericksburg and Salem Church, which is ancillary uh, to the, uh, the big dramatic uh, turning movement of Joe Hooker's, uh, is really a fascinating study, and I think people who participate in it are going to enjoy it a great deal. So, uh, with that, um, can, uh, I, can yeah, I just make one, else, Paul? one final comment? Uh, yeah. I want to read you something that uh, Jay Luvas wrote a long time ago. He said, Several years ago, the authors were among a group of historians at Carlisle Barracks tasked to develop a list of battles in history where one side had fought outnumbered and won. Obviously, chances. Chancellorsville was prominently on that list and dutifully made its way to the Pentagon. None of us, however, had the courage, unfortunately, to point out the obvious. Whatever gave Lee the victory, it works best when Hooker is the opposing commander. <laughs> I, I, I think there's not much else you can say to that. Greg, would you like to offer a, a, a closing thought on, uh, on uh, your view of... Uh, what we're about to do in December and uh, why you wanted to be a part of it? Well, most of the time when I've been asked to cover Second Fredericksburg Salem Church, as you might imagine, it's part of, say, a multiple day Chancellorsville tour. And obviously, when we do this one day of Salem Church in Second Fredericksburg, we will need to make uh, the, the connection with what else is going on at Chancellorsville, much as we've done today. But we also have the opportunity to look at 
um, the exact same ground that was fought over twice as we go to look at Marie's Heights and the Sunken Road. Even places like Manassas, where there's a first and second Manassas, uh, I can't think of too many places where one side is in the exact same position and the enemy is attacking from the, uh, the same direction as in first Fredericksburg and second Fredericksburg. So we also have an opportunity to, to compare the way those two attacks were made and to maybe make some conclusions as to why one was successful and one was disastrous. I appreciate that. And uh, for those of you who have uh, stayed with us this whole program and so forth, um, you know, reflect on this as you make your decisions and things that you may uh, want to do and whether you want to join us or not. This is an area where 100,000 men fell as casualties. We're talking about folks who were killed and wounded and are captured. It is not inconsequential. 100,000 people is more than any army Lee ever fielded in the, uh, in the war, and yet uh, this ground is fought over time and again and again. Fredericksburg is the dare mark line. It is, the, it is the point in which once you cross it, you're deeply into Virginia, and now you're closer to Richmond than you are to D.C. Uh, when you push back and you cross the Rappahannock, you are now closer to Washington than you are to Richmond. It is, it is the center spot in a huge tug of war uh, between two uh, mighty forces and uh, the price that is paid in blood uh, can never be overlooked uh, if you don't uh, and should not ever be overlooked if you are serious about honoring and studying the people who have fought to make us uh, the country uh, that we are. So with that, Greg, uh, Paul, sure looking forward to working with you guys. It will be the last program of 2021. Uh, we are hopeful we'll get a lot of stuff uh, uh, moved, and uh, hopefully we'll not have COVID uh, restrictions in the way by then. But uh, look for us. Let us know if you're interested in joining us. We'd love to see you. Gentlemen, thank you. Karen, thank you for uh, for expertly uh, providing us everything we needed at the time. So you all have a great night, and uh, we'll see you uh, the next time. Bye-bye.